Professor Crotty, the research from you and your team that's been featured in the New York Times and has been recently held up by Dr. Fauci at a congressional hearing has been key to our understanding about how our immune system reacts to this new coronavirus and its implications for vaccines. I've gathered a lot of questions from our viewers about immunity and vaccines, including the basic question, how safe are mRNA vaccines? But before we get to those questions, can you briefly explain your most recent research about SARS-CoV-2? Sure. The most recent was to ask, essentially, do people have uh, immune memory to this virus or not? And what does that memory look like? And immune memory really is a lot like brain memory. Um, it's You've seen something before and um, your, your immune system has figured out how to recognize it and remember it. It's really one of three major parts that you've got antibodies, then you've got helper T cells, and you've got killer T cells. And the, the simple way to think about those is antibodies are really good at stopping a virus outside of cells, but once a virus has infected the cells, then you really need T cells. T cells are specialized for dealing with infected cells. And antibodies get made by um, B cells. And so in terms of memory, you've really got memory B cells that can make the antibodies. You've got the antibodies that are actually circulating in your blood. And then you've got these two kinds of T cells that can either kill cells or have other jobs. And so what we did was to ask in people who had had COVID-19, um, do they have these four kinds of memory and some subflavors of those? How much of that and how long did it last? And the, the quick answer was... Um, Essentially, like 95% of people at, at six to eight months post-infection uh, really had a robust amount of, of immune memory based on, on these measurements we did. And this is, this is the largest study of immune memory ever in people to actually measure all of these different parts of immune memory. So it was, it, um, <laughs> it was a lot of work, <laughs> um, uh, but the results were pretty interesting that, that people's immune system do tend to be... Re remembering this virus pretty well. So that was our recent study. SARS-CoV-2 is made up of, what is it, 25 or 28 major proteins? And Correct. the scientists at Pfizer and BioNTech and, and Moderna have isolated the messenger RNA for just the spike protein. Is that correct? Is, this, is spike protein made up of one protein or of multiple proteins? <laughs> It's one, it's one protein, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a trimer, so it ends up being three copies of the same protein. So it's all encoded by one RNA. It's the same, same sequence, um, just uh, three, three, folded together three times. Got it. Why did both companies choose to use spike protein for their target for this vaccine? Right. So uh, there are about 29 licensed human vaccines, depending on how you count, and almost all of them work on the basis of protective antibody responses. Um, and so when you're trying to move fast with, with vaccine development, the most obvious target is to try and make antibodies against the protein that's on the surface of the virus, because um, antibodies work by by binding to the surface of a virus and essentially covering the virus and keeping the virus from, from doing anything. Um, that, that's really the, the simple way uh, to think about antibodies working. And so for previous coronaviruses, it was known that there are a couple of different proteins on the surface of, of the virus, um, but it's really the spike protein that's the major one and, and probably the most important antibody target. And sure enough, in the months subsequent to, to those decisions, lots of data have accumulated that have said uh, essentially all of the neutralizing antibodies, the important antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 are against the spike protein. So the spike protein is the best target to focus on for, for antibodies. Um, and when I talk to you about, you know, there really being three parts of the immune system, one of the concerns has been that, well, sometimes antibodies aren't that great at stopping all viruses, and then you really need the T cells to kick in. And the T cells don't necessarily recognize spike. They might recognize some of those other 25 proteins. And so that was actually our first major scientific study on COVID-19 was to ask in infected people, do, do people make T cells that recognize spike also, um, or only other proteins? And what we found 
was that in infected people, actually people make a lot of T cell responses to spike also. And so that was a really, that was a good sign supporting the vaccine development at all. That if you, if you are some, some viruses, you have to choose more than one protein for this virus. It's looked like, yeah, just choosing one protein is a, is a reasonable way to, to try and get antibody responses and T cell responses. Along those lines, if this virus mutated, um, well, we know it's mutating all the time, but if there was a mutation, um, I guess, is it possible that there's a mutation where this virus could infect and, and cause harm without the spike protein? No, not without the spike protein. Um, the, the questions really about whether, you know, if this is the spike protein, can it mutate the spike protein so it looks a little bit different? And now a- antibodies are, are recognizing the three-dimensional structure. They're, they're physically binding. It's sort of like, if, well, I mean, it's, it's like anything. It's like, you know, it's like my mouse, right? And it's like, well, maybe the antibodies are really recognizing this little knobby wheel. And if they're just recognizing that and the, the virus mutates that, well, now you're in trouble because you're, you're not seeing the other parts of it. And so that's something people have been spending a lot of attention to of where exactly are those virus mutations and then where are the antibody responses people are, are making. Um, and uh, viruses behave different ways. So so flu is a really big problem in that way where flu is clearly able to mutate, but lots of other viruses um, aren't. So so like measles, there's been a measles vaccine for what 70 years now, and the virus has never managed to mutate away from that. And same thing with uh, polio and hepatitis B. Um, and, and so far, it looks like 95% of people still had antibodies that neutralized that virus very well. And that's probably because every single person is making multiple different antibodies. So even if the virus has one mutation, that, that doesn't escape because it's only escaping one little part of the immune response. The, the scientists have been able to isolate this one strand of mRNA that just codes for the spike protein. Um, and then they packaged it into what are called lipid nanoparticles. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Basically, just little fat droplets, if you will, right? Very small, <laughs> uh, microscopic fat droplets. Super tiny butter droplets. Yep, that's <laughs> okay. basically what you're talking about. <laughs> so why why do they package it that way? And, and also, how do they package it that way? They have this mRNA. How do they get it into the lipid nanoparticle? Yeah, so, uh, um, and so I think f- for that, we also need to deal with just uh, what is RNA and, and why is an RNA vaccine a reasonable approach? So RNA is a really common molecule in your body. Um, uh, essentially, all living things use RNA as uh, messages, and, and those messages encode within a cell uh, at any one of your cells at any given time. You've got like 5,000 different RNAs, and in those RNAs are each encoding different messages that tell the cells to do different things, make different proteins. Um, and, and RNAs are made to be transient, so they're really a lot like, uh, it's like 5,000 post-it notes, and they'll be around for minutes or hours, and then they get shredded up and they're gone. They're, they're temporary. Um, and so an RNA vaccine is the same thing. It's a, it's a temporary message but it has to get into the cell. And so if it's in the cell, the cell will now read that message and do what the message says, which helps then instruct the immune system. Um, and then and then the message goes away, okay? So, so RNA are these temporary messages, um, or like Snapchat messages was the other analogy that I've, uh, that I've used. It, there's a message and then it, it, it expires. Um, technologically, one of the big challenges there is that RNA is temporary. It gets shredded up really easily. Um, again, like just shredding up a post-it note. Um, and so uh, you got to get it into the cells without it all getting shredded up. So if you just um, inject RNA from a syringe into somebody's uh, skin, uh, it, it doesn't get into the cells. So the the trick that people figured out over the past 10 years was, oh, you can put it in these little these little butter droplets. <laughs> and those little <laughs> droplets will basically fuse with the cells and release the RNA into the cell. So now you've got the message has now made it into the cell where it needs to be read, and then it can be shredded up uh, afterwards. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's a delivery system to get them all, get the RNA into the cells. 
the lipid nanoparticle that's taken this mRNA vaccine, what cells in our body does it actually go into? Is it just muscle cells in our arm where we get the injection? So yeah, it's a good question. So it definitely goes into muscle cells, um, and 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 I think and scientists are still learning uh, which cells are the important cells. Basically, is it <laughs> um, most of the cells that are getting the RNA are the muscle cells, and it's possible that specialized cells of the immune system um, that that aren't very common, um, uh, but they may get the RNA, and those may be the uh, more important for starting the immune response. But yeah, most of the RNA is going into the muscle cells, and I'm sure the protein expression there matters. It's just um, that that might not be the only cell type that matters. A question that a lot of people have had is um, once that mRNA gets into our cells and codes for that spike protein, does it just code? Does, does each strand of mRNA just code for one spike protein and then does does the uh the post-it node or the mrna get destroyed or or dissolve or does it code for multiple proteins and and last for maybe an hour or a day like how long does the mrna um, from this vaccine actually last in our cells approximately yeah it's a good question so the goal so the rna gets read multiple times so it'll just keep uh, it um it gets read over and over and over again um, so that you make a lot of the spike protein, which will then get expressed on the surface of the cell to stimulate the immune system. Um, and I'd say average RNAs in your cell will last some time, uh, generally minutes to hours, uh, but some of them will last uh, a day or more. And these, the RNA vaccines are engineered to be stable. And so um, uh, the information I've seen is that they'll last a couple of days. So we have the mRNA inside of a lipid nanoparticle. Um, what else goes in, in the vaccine? Obviously, it's got to be some type of saline solution or, or, or something. Um, right. That's it. It's basically, um, it's basically just delivered in some, essentially, yeah, some salt water set to match the, the, the saltiness of your own body so that it's uh, uh, is essentially as natural as possible. It seems like a question that a lot of people have with vaccines in general is, okay, well, what else do they put in them? And right. uh, from my understanding with this Pfizer Bio BioNTech vaccine, they came out and said, we didn't put any adjuvants or preservatives in this particular um, vaccine. Um, why are adjuvants used sometimes in vaccines? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so essentially, usually adjuvants are, are used. Um, and it goes back to uh, what I said about immune memory at the beginning. You know, your immune system uh, some th remembers some things really well and, and remembers other things really poorly. Um, and uh, there are complexities there, but the, the rule of thumb is that the bigger the threat, then the bigger the memory. Um, it's a lot like um, you know, you might not be able to remember what socks you put on two days ago, um, but if uh, if you were almost in a car accident at some particular intersection, you're going to remember that intersection for a very long time, right? Because it was a it was a memorable event. Um, and so vaccines have to deal with the same thing that the immune system is good at ignoring things that aren't very threatening, and so adjuvants are a way of of providing the immune system a stimulation that says hey, this thing that you're about to see, um, this is a potential threat and you should make um, a substantial immune response to it and remember it. And so that's, uh, if you just inject a, a protein by itself, that protein's inert, it's non-threatening, it's not replicating, it's not gonna do anything to you. And so the adjuvant is, is the immune stimulus to, to get you going. Um, An RNA vaccine essentially ends up encoding its own um, its own stimulation, so it accomplishes that on its own. The the lipid nanoparticles done its job. It's brought the mRNA into the cell, and now it's the ribosome's job to actually code or basically, essentially, build a, a protein out of that right, instruction. Right. Right. So what your immune system ends up needing to see in the end are proteins, because that's what the virus itself is made out of proteins. The spike proteins are, are on the surface of the virus and, and it's those proteins that an antibody or T cells would would recognize. Um, and your cells are making proteins all the time as instructed by RNA messages. So now instead they're going to make these viral spike proteins and, and that's what the immune system will start recognizing. And that uh, um, that does get triggered by 
just the normal protein synthesis machinery in the cells, which is, um, yeah, which are the ribosomes and the amino acids already in your cells. Why not just skip a step and, and use a vaccine that, uh, uses the spike protein itself? Why go through this extra step of the, of the RNA? Right. That's a really good question. So, and one of the classic ways to make a vaccine is to, um, uh, have the vaccine be the protein, be the be the viral spike protein, or be a viral nanoparticle. Um, and there are vaccines that work uh, fantastically well that way. And some of the original vaccines going back to the early 20th century um, are that way. That the tetanus vaccine and diphtheria vaccine, which are incredibly successful. Um, and in fact, some of the COVID-19 vaccines currently being worked on are are protein vaccines. Um, uh, and there's a reasonable chance those will succeed as, as vaccines. Um, a downside to protein vaccines is that you have to manufacture the protein and the manufacturing process for any given protein um, is its own unique manufacturing problem. And so in terms of just a, a physical production problem, you've got to solve that production problem. And since that's unique, the FDA has to basically review every step of it and agree that, that, that everything is fine about, uh, uh, about that. And viral proteins tend to be kind of unusual proteins. They're not, they're not super simple to manufacture. So it can take some time and energy to figure out how to, how to solve that basically manufacturing problem, that, that biochemistry protein synthesis problem. The RNA vaccines bypass that problem because the manufacturing process is always the same. Um, the RNA encodes a different sequence, but molecularly it's the same manufacturing process. And so um, FDA approval and whatnot and, and is, is all really fast because um, it, it just it, it looks the same from a manufacturing standpoint. So that's why the RNA vaccines have, have gone through phase one, phase two, phase three trials so fast and gotten FDA approval so quick. Um, is because they were they were very fast to manufacture and very fast to approve because it's um, uh, largely once they solve the problem once it's plug and play. So along those lines, do you think this is really the future of vaccine development is using this type of technology? I mean. The, the results are incredibly encouraging, right? I mean, this is the first time ever in human history there's been a vaccine developed within a calendar year. Uh, and, uh, and not only that, that, now it's actually been three, right? There have been three successful phase three clinical trials within a single calendar year. That, that's never happened for anything. Um, so those are phenomenal successes. Um, and the RNA vaccine showing 95% efficacy, right? And fantastic efficacy in the elderly and fantastic efficacy against severe disease. I mean, those are, those are huge wins and, and RNA vaccines are definitely going to be, um, successful solutions again in the future. Um, I think they're likely to still be part of the vaccine toolbox. I don't think they'll solve, um, every problem. There are some things that, uh, I think they're, uh, they're good at, and there are other things that, that, that other vaccine technologies may be better at. Um, but in terms of speed, I mean, nothing can, can match this, you know, I mean, vaccine development classically is frequently a 20 year process, right? Or, you know, let's say a 10 year process. And instead you're talking about a 10 month process, you know, it's, uh, uh, not only a 10 month process, but a 10 month process that really involved, uh, a huge amount of safety data on right? I mean, you know, 70,000 doses being given and tested to validate both the efficacy and the safety that, um, clearly RNA vaccines have a, a very promising future. From my understanding, mRNA, um, does its work just in the cytoplasm of our cells. Is that correct? That's correct. So yeah, I've gotten lots of questions about, well, wait, isn't this genetic engineering? I don't want to be genetically engineered. And I'm like, well, fair enough. I don't want to be genetically engineered either. <laughs> um, but, but this is RNA. It's just messages. They're, they're transient, temporary. They don't become part of your body. Uh, it's, it's just not the same thing as DNA. Now, what about, speaking of DNA, the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine candidate that, that 
utilizes DNA. Yeah, so um, and so both the AstraZeneca uh, approach and the Johnson and Johnson approach use um, a viral vector, um, and it is a viral vector that contains DNA, but ba really it's it's about the virus. So they're they're using a different virus, an adenovirus, as a delivery system um, into your cells. Essentially, you know, sort of like giving you one viral infection to teach your immune system how to fight another viral infection. That's that's also transient DNA. That doesn't become part of your DNA. That's that's just the virus's DNA. And those viral vectors, they've been they've been gutted um, so that they can't become another adenovirus. It's 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 like taking a car and taking out the engine, you know, and uh, even and taking out the seats. Um, it still looks like a car from the outside and you can put some new stuff in it <laughs> and you're sort of showing that to the immune system to teach it what something looks like, but it's not going to go drive off on its own or anything. Got it. Okay, so going back to our kind of step-by-step -step process, we have the mRNA, the ribosome then codes for a, a spike protein. Um, does that spike protein then get released from our, our cells? Um, does it get expressed on the surface of our cells or both? Uh, both. Predominantly, it's getting expressed on the surface of the cells. Um, and that's just, um, that, that's where, well, that's a good way for it to be shown to the immune system, basically. So it gets shown to the immune system, and then, and then what happens? Uh, so... <laughs> A thousand different things. <laughs> so an immune response is a really complicated, orchestrated dance. But essentially, you have in your body right now parts of your adaptive immune system that, that can potentially recognize any possible virus that would ever exist. Um, but to do that, you have billions of cells that are all really rare. So it's basically there's like one in a million cells somewhere that could actually make the antibodies that would recognize the virus that would stop it. And same thing with the T cells. So what has to happen is those very rare cells have to be exposed to this new protein. And then since those cells are so rare, they're not very useful when they're, you know, one in a million, one in a billion cells uh, in your body. Uh, so those cells have to grow and divide and multiply until there are millions of them. And, and that takes time. Um, and that's one of the big goals of a vaccine is to really the whole point of a vaccine is to show your immune system what the virus looks like before you're infected so that your immune system can go through that learning process and that growth process on its own, uh, on your immune system's own time and get you to a point where now, okay, you've got the antibodies and you've got the T cells and you're going to have that immune memory um, all before you ever get exposed to the virus. So normally when you get exposed to the virus, the virus gets the head start, okay? Um, and then your immune system is playing catch up. Your immune system has these rare cells that can potentially protect you but they're rare um, and they have to grow from one cell into a million cells. And usually that takes a week and you get sick for that week in the meantime. Uh, so you talked about this cascade of um, immune system effects and response to either a vaccine or a natural infection. Um, <clears throat> with a vaccine, what, what symptoms would you expect when the immune system is really ramping up and, and responding? Yeah, it's another good question, and 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 I get it. I, I get it a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I definitely tell people, you know, these vaccines are safe. Um, that that doesn't mean they're they're not gonna uh, uh, make you not feel so great for a day or two, or have a little bit of a fever, and, th and that can be a really positive thing because essentially this goes back to. Um, your immune system is really designed to to remember things that were something of a threat, you know, and so it's uh, you, you really do kind of have to earn your immunity some uh, a lot like going to the gym and working out, you know, if you get really sore, that can really be a positive sign. Same kind of thing for for a vaccine. If you if you've got some swelling, if you've got some redness, if you got a little bit of a fever, those are basically all straightforward signs that your immune system is working, is doing its job of recognizing that vaccine and, and building building the, the tools and weapons to fight the virus if uh, if they see it. And, and usually for most vaccines, that can go on for 
you know, uh, one day, two days, three days. And that's been what people have been seeing with these RNA vaccines as well. Um, most people get uh, a bit of redness and a bit of soreness. And uh, and some people get uh, get a real fever uh, for a day. And, and that's that, that's honestly just a positive sign that your immune system is uh, is is fighting it. <laughs> so, I mean, side effect is almost the wrong terminology for that. I mean, it's, it's really kind of an expected immunogenic response. Exactly. And that's that's why it's it's important uh, to recognize that safety is really important for vaccines because vaccines are given to healthy people. And that's always been the a key feature of vaccines is, is paying a lot of attention to, to safety. Um, uh, but that's different than than, yeah, what we're talking about here of uh of, of getting sore um, or, or feeling feeling a bit tired, those, those can be sort of essentially on target effects. Signs that your immune signs of the vaccine is really working. The guidance from the FDA and the CDC with the, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine is that even people who have had a previous uh, SARS CoV two infection should get the vaccine. Um, I think a lot of people were initially confused by this. Um, why do you think they made that recommendation? Yeah, it's a good question, and it's because um, we don't, like as of today, and certainly as of a couple of weeks ago, we don't have a good grasp of how long does protective immunity last after you've been, uh, after you've had COVID-19, um, and we also don't know how long it lasts after the vaccines, um, uh, but so far the, the vaccines are, are, are looking good. Um, in our data, when we looked at immune memory in people, right, we were seeing something like 95% of people had what we consider uh, immune memory that looks good. Um, but that still doesn't prove that those people are going to have protective immunity. Um, really, you have to have bigger, longer studies to wait and see, you know, how long do, are people protected? And so, uh, uh, yeah, I think the vaccine recommendation is is the right one. If we if we knew for sure that have, that catching COVID-19 really did give you protective immunity uh, for a long time, then I think the vaccine recommendation would be would be no, don't bother. But as it stands right now, we don't know that. And so it makes sense to still recommend getting getting the vaccine. And is it possible that the vaccine can actually give longer immunity than a natural infection? To it's possible. Um, there are definitely vaccines that that do that. Um, uh, so the papillomavirus vaccine is a fantastic example of a vaccine where the vaccine works way better than natural infection at generating protective immunity and long lasting immunity. Um, the opposite also occurs. I mean, the normal flu vaccine really gives pretty short lived immunity. But if you actually catch the flu, the, your immunity to that flu is really quite, quite long lasting. So it can go both ways. And since RNA vaccines are new, we don't have a historical reference point for comparison. So, um, so far, the data with the RNA vaccines has been fantastic. And really, the big unanswered question with them at this point is durability. How long are they going to last? And and right now, we don't we don't know how long uh, durability is going to last for the vaccine compared to having had the infection. The Pfizer BioNTech. Uh, vaccine and the Moderna vaccines are very similar. Why does the Pfizer vaccine need to be stored at negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit uh, when the Moderna vaccine just needs regular refrigeration? It's pretty cold, right? Well, I think the Moderna one requires the very cold for long-term storage, but for a shorter term, um, it can do better. And in fact, there are other RNA vaccine formulations that have been published uh, later in 2020 that, that could actually do room temperature uh, storage. Um, it, it comes down to the nature, the precise nature of those lipid nanoparticles and, and how uh, and how stable they are. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Professor Crotty. If you had a family member or a close friend um, say to you, you know, Professor, you've uh, studied vaccines and, and immunity your entire career. Um, uh, this vaccine looks promising, but it, you know, as, as you mentioned, the timeline has been so much shorter than what we're used to with vaccines, and it's using a new technology, this RNA technology. Um, should I be nervous about this? What would you say? Yeah, great question. Um, and and the answer is no. Don't don't be nervous. Definitely get vaccinated if you can get vaccinated. I mean, obviously, for one, 
right now the COVID-19 threat in the population is 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 horrible, right? I mean, we've we, we've crossed uh, thresholds of like 3,000 deaths a day in in the country. I mean, those are uh, uh, it's a really bad situation. Uh, and on the flip side, these vaccines are, you know, 95% effective. That in two totally independent trials of huge numbers of people, that data is really strong. These vaccines definitely work. Um, and yeah, I certainly get questions um, about safety, which are reasonable questions to ask, uh, again, because you said because of the speed. And so there are two parts of it. One is you would be really hard pressed to find any medicine that has had this much safety data already by the time it becomes publicly available. Again, 70,000 people have already gotten the vaccine and been tracked for safety. That's a huge amount of safety data, way more than most medicines get um, when, when they come to market. So, I mean, those are, and the reason for accumulating all of that was actually because of speed. <laughs> it's actually, um, uh, find results quick enough, they had to have a huge number of people involved in the study. And so as a result, they got a ton of safety data. And they've also got safety data going, you know, for, for essentially six months from from the earlier clinical trials that got started in, in the summer. Really, the best way to think about the speed of development is, one, this is a technology that could move very fast through manufacturing. And that's really where a lot of the speed came from was, was manufacturing. The the, the safety parts of it is the same amount of time as, as it basically always takes. And the other thing that's been fast about it has been problems that money could solve. So normally for developing a vaccine, somebody goes through a phase one trial and then waits and then goes through a phase trial and waits and then goes through a phase three. They don't invest a huge amount of money up front because there's a good chance that they would lose that money. And instead, in this situation, right, going back to March, companies, governments, and non-government organizations were all saying, okay, invest the billion dollars up front, you know, and sure, we may lose that money, um, but if it works, we'll have a vaccine, you know, a year faster than we otherwise would because we're just paying for the manufacturing to get going up front. That's just a money, that's just a problem money can solve. You can just be losing that money in the end, but you're, you're not taking any shortcuts. You're just starting the process a lot earlier than you would otherwise. And sure enough, things worked out incredibly well, right? And these vaccines are actually working. And so now there are already vaccine doses being delivered instead of the companies now starting to manufacture them and then being delivered, you know, six months or more later. And as you mentioned, there's good data and there's a lot of data about um, safety in the short term. Um, what about long term potential side effects. I know that's another concern. Yeah, good that question. Have. And that was, uh, and so that was one of the main ones that the FDA wanted to consider as well. And so basically they did a review of, uh, of, of vaccine literature and said, uh, uh, yeah, in the past for all these other vaccines, any important vaccine safety signature was clear within two months. And so that's why the FDA specifically uh, demanded that there be two full months of, of safety data on these large trials and, and that that's what's being reviewed by by the FDA. And and they've, yeah, they've looked fine. So in other words, if based on, on the extensive history we have with vaccines, if you don't see a safety concern in the first two months of, of use of the vaccine, it's unlikely to see long-term side effects down the road. From it. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. That's exactly right. Well, Professor Crotty, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And um, briefly, any uh, next projects that you're, you and your team there at the lab are focusing on? Uh, yeah, so I mean, here at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology, we're, we're, we're one of the best places in the world studying the immune system, and we can actually look at all these different immune responses to uh, COVID-19 at the same time, which, which most uh, places can't. So we're, we're continuing to, to examine that both to try and understand acute disease, you know, why people end up in the hospital, as well as immune, immune memory to this virus. And it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work, but, it, but it's important. So those are the problems we keep trying to solve. Well, thanks so much for your time and all your research and work. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. <laughs>